Alright guys, well, I guess we have to take one day off from the spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful weather we have had in September of 2024 before it returns again tomorrow, but right now it is a nasty, gloomy, gray, depressing, yuck rainy day here and the collapse of everything and of course it has to hit on Saturday <coughs> which would be Saturday September 7th 2024 and uh, it is now what time is it 1230 and I am I have barely left the uh, <laughs> left my bedroom in the tiny house on this gloomy day so what can we rant about oh man all the you know it's just hard for me to rant about the the heat wave out in California and that this has been the hottest summer of the planet's history or whatever while I'm sitting here shivering in my flannel bathrobe in my Uggs where it is now what is it 54 degrees here at Bugs in a Jar Farm in the Finger Lakes of New York on September 7th so I'm going to skip over all of this uh, planet boiling and I'm just going to check in with this I like to check in uh, with these lefties over at Counterpunch every now and then who still seem to have a little bit of testosterone left in their bodies and uh, one of my favorite lefty writers over here is Tom Englehart and I've read several of his selections from his uh, I guess it's Tom's Dispatch uh, and so, what is on Tom's mind today? He's talking about all of the words ending in topia, and he starts off, you know, being a lefty with a uh, a, a uh, Trump derangement syndrome, uh, and this humorous article, Trump topia and beyond and uh, as much as I enjoyed his opening Trump derangement syndrome opening uh, I, I, I'm just going to skip ahead to uh, that was his segue into the to the larger uh, <laughs> the, the larger part of this article a distinctly topian world. Spe speaking of topias, my more or less namesake, since my first name is Thomas and my middle name Moore, Sir Thomas Moore produced the first utopia, inventing that very word for the title of his 1516 novel about a fictional island in the then barely known or even imagined new world. And almost half a millennia later, while an editor at Pantheon Books, I would put out, or more accurately, stumble upon and reintroduce to our strange world, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's 1950 and 1915 utopian masterpiece, Herland. Still, if either Moore or Gilman were alive today, I doubt that they would be writing utopian anythings. Even the word dystopian might no longer seem strong enough for this grim world of ours. Perhaps what we need for 2024 and beyond on a planet going down big time even if in slow motion is an altogether new word, something like catastropian, that would be 
H.G. Wells or George Orwell multiplied by 10. Maybe I mean 100 and not faintly in the same universe with Moore or Gilman. Catastropian, catastropian or catastropian. I like that. I think that's a good a word as any, brother. <clears throat> Our world is now, in fact, mega dystopian in so many ways, it's almost hard to fathom. And I'm not just thinking of the nearly 50,000 people believed to have died in Europe alone last year from the mega fires, droughts, and devastating heat waves of climate change. Nor am I thinking of the more than 40,000 Palestinians and still counting slaughtered in Gaza over the last 10 months in a war that never seems to end on, again, if this were fiction, you would not believe it, a strip of land only 25 miles long and 4 to 7 miles wide. And worse yet, it is painfully clear that instead of facing our catastrophian future of ever more disastrous planetary overheating, humanity continues to find itself distracted in a distinctly metatopian fashion by all too many other nightmares that show not the slightest sign of ending. And if, in this paragraph, I made up a word or two to fit this new word of world of ours, I hope you will forgive me. Admittedly, the one thing we are missing to fully transform an already thoroughly dystopian planet other than the arrival of a devastatingly hostile extraterrestrials and UFOs, is an actual world war. Still, three major conflicts continue to roll, rattle, or royal on this planet of ours. One in Ukraine, and now Russia too. One in Gaza, that's increasingly threatening to spread across the Middle East, and one in Sudan, all of them murderous and none of them showing the slightest sign of going away, more or less ever. Each of them accounts for staggering numbers of humans being slaughtered or disappearing in who knows what horrific ways. Even as such wars pour yet more devastating greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, helping ensure that this planet continues to become too hot to handle. And mind you, the U.S. military alone emits more hydrocarbons than whole countries like Portugal, or Denmark. I mean, tell me all of that doesn't add up to a truly big time, if slow rolling version of dystopia, or possibly worse. In fact, if once upon a time you had been able to put all of this into a dystopian novel, I guarantee you that no one would have found it faintly credible even as an imagined future. Consider, for instance, a significant power in the Middle East backed financially and militarily, weapon by endless weapon, by the once mightiest nation on planet Earth, fighting an unending war with almost any imaginable kind of weaponry short of an atomic bomb against a modest-sized guerrilla force 
on a tiny strip of land holding a population of about 2.1 million people, essentially destroying more or less everything in sight and still not winning. Put that in a novel and you would be laughed out of the dystopian living room. And that's just to start describing the grim fantasy world of present-day reality where, more than 500 years later, even the faintest sense of utopia is all too literally missing in action. Hey, and while you're at it, imagine Russia's leader on a planet where the Cold War is ancient history, deciding to invade Ukraine and fight a never-ending, wildly destructive conflict there year after endless year, while my country, as if it were indeed still in a Cold War world, backed the Ukrainians to the tune of something like 117 billion dollars, much of it in the form of advanced weaponry, while no one seems even faintly interested in launching negotiations for peace of any sort. A mad, mad planet. In the context of all of this, Consider Donald Trump's latest run for the presidency, a sign sent from, well, I won't even try to guess where, that this country, which its leaders not so long ago considered the only power of significance, and then at least the greatest power on planet Earth, is going down, down, down all too fast, fast, fast. Now, don't misconstrue me on this. The U.S. still, quote, invests more in its military than the next nine countries combined and well over a trillion dollars annually in what it calls, quote, national defense. And given that, isn't it strange how few Americans consider it, yes, strange, that this country has not won a war of any significance since World War II, and that may, in fact, be one reason it's visibly heading for hell in a handbasket, even if Kamala Harris and Tim Walls do pull off this election. Of course, if they do, given Donald Trump and the increasingly mega dystopian nature of the United States, don't be surprised to see it begin in its own fashion to come apart at the, you fill this one in, blank topian seams. After all, an estimated one of every 20 Americans now owns at least a single AR-15 rifle, which is about as close as you can get to a machine gun without actually having one. And no surprise here, mass shootings in this country in recent years averaged more than 600 annually. Now, assuming Donald Trump does not, in fact, win election 2024, just for a moment, try to imagine this country in November. It's a given, of course, that should he lose, Trump and his crew will denounce that loss as, a fraud, as fraudulent and dispute it big time. He's already saying the 2024 election will be rigged against him. With that in mind, imagine the, quote, lone superpower of planet Earth 
a mere three decades ago as it now begins to come apart at the seams. And mind you, were he to win the election, assume that he would be almost guaranteed to use the Insurrection Act to dispatch the American military to the streets of Washington, D.C. and other democratic cities to suppress anyone demonstrating against his victory and the Trump-topia to come. <clears throat> Were Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz to win and not be instantly challenged by a country coming apart at the seams, their administration would undoubtedly continue supporting the wars in Gaza and Ukraine and largely ignoring the one in Sudan. In her convention acceptance speech, in fact, Harris plugged the sort of militarized foreign policy that's been ours forever and a day. Quoting Kamala, I will never hesitate to take whatever action is necessary to defend our forces and our interests against Iran and Iran-backed terrorists. Close quote. Still, she and Waltz would not be set on quite literally heating the planet to the boiling point in the fashion of Donald Trump and his big oil buddies. And, of course, I will hit the, uh, as much as I like Tom Englehart, uh, I, I will hit the bullshit detected button um, on that line of unadulterated horseshit. Uh, Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz would be every single bit uh, as, as much as Donald Trump would be set on quite literally heating the planet to the boiling point. And then he does at least uh, have the balls to uh, add this comment. Though, mind you, even without Donald Trump, my country, my country, you know, during the Biden-Harris administration, has set absolute global records in recent years for producing oil and exporting natural gas. So how can he say that and then claim uh, that, uh, that Kamala Harris w w won't be every bit I I as gung-ho as Donald Trump to uh, send this planet to the boiling point? Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go off on uh, that rant. Back to Tom. <clears throat> and I have not even mentioned that only recently California ablaze had its hottest month in recorded history, or that the good news on planet Earth was that unlike the previous 13 months, July may not know not have set a new monthly global record for heat, but merely come in a remarkably close second to the worst July 2023 in human history. Now, of course, this uh, came out, you know, just a few days uh, before, you know, it was published, I guess, by Copernicus that... June, July, and August, I guess, for the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, well, he's talking about the state of California, uh, which is now seeing its hottest week of the summer in September. But, you know, this was written before June, July, and August of 2024 were declared the hottest summer 
pretty much since records began. Uh, anyway, uh, mind you, the last 10 Julys have been the 10 hottest ever, and climate change was barely mentioned at the Democratic convention, while the Trumpublicans continued to attack Harris and other Democrats for their war on American energy. So, how you Y-O-Utopian can we get? Fiction? You must be kidding. Don't even think about creating imaginary worlds on a planet where reality is becoming the biggest fiction of all and our mega, catastrophic, dismiss, piss-topian moment could leave anything the human mind might conjure up all too literally in the dust of history. So yes, put that novel you're writing in a drawer. Ours is now a world that indeed does increasingly threaten to leave fiction in the dust and give dystopian a whole new meaning. In short, you and I are living in a reality that looks ever more sadly fictional. And I am not going to embarrass Tom uh, or myself or your intelligence by reading his closing uh, parag ain't gonna happen par final paragraph uh, to uh, do everything in his power to ruin an otherwise excellent essay. Leave that to your imagination. I will, if you want to read the final sentence, I will uh, post a link to the essay. And you can read the parts I left out. But anyway, thank you, Tom Englehart, for summing up our catastrophic Catastropian, catastropian planet. And with that, I think I have to go see a man about a kitten. Get out there and enjoy your pistopian planet while you still can. My guys.